So now we are going to have an incredible conversation with two individuals that I admire so much for the work that they do. It's titled Fashion is Dead, giving birth to the next generation of creative icons featuring Fernando Garcia. And with us we have Kari Simone, the creative director at Hearst, alongside Fernando Garcia, the co-creative director for Oscar de la Renta. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Please forgive me. I just want to make sure I get the thank yous out of the way. I wanted to thank Donna, Marcelo, Fashion Innovation, the city of Miami, and uh, everyone else to come here to this event. <laughs> thank you as well for me. <laughs> <laughs> Again, my name is Kyrie Simon, and I'm the creative director. Not only am I creative director at Hearst, I do a lot of art projects, and I have a lot of people I chat with because I'm nosy, you know. And I just how like, nosy? <laughs> I'm super nosy, okay. <laughs> and I'm, I just like talking. And so today's chat is just a talk. Interrupt at any time. Ask questions at any time. If I say something wrong, if I get the wrong name, please interrupt me. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Fernando, thank you again. Number one, you are a force of nature within fashion, a quiet force of nature, in a sense. How do you keep yourself humble in a world with so much overstatement and grandeur and stuff like that? Um, I think that it depends on how you were raised. My family was always uh, very appreciative of everything that came our way. And then I surrounded myself in the work environment with people that like the same things that I liked, staying at home, playing games. I don't know, there's like a, there's a context around you that makes you who you are. And, um, and yeah, that's the kind of life I have, even though it's fancy looking. <laughs> I'm really boring, I promise. Well, speaking of how you were raised, okay, tell me a bit, of where are you from originally? I'm Dominican, um, <laughs> proud Dominican. Uh, right. But my family's from Spain. So okay. I have a mix. Uh, I would go to Spain in the summers, and then sometimes to New York for Christmases. So um, definitely traveled a lot when I was young, but um, it was mixed. It was like Latino, European, and American. All right. And as little Fernando, yeah. you were interested in architecture. As little Fernando, I think that I was interested in the film industry. Um, I fell in love with uh, movies at a very young age, and um, if I'm co completely frank, I think I fell in love with fashion by accident. I, um, I started watching red carpets because my mom kept telling me, oh, let's watch this red carpet, let's do this, let's do that. And, uh, and then I fell in love with award shows, and I started diving into who John Galliano and Tom Ford and all of these amazing uh, geniuses were at the time, and then I discovered that I could sort of connect with the person that I was watching on screen by going to the store of the brand that she wore. Uh, and it created this like insatiable need to like continue connecting and creating and finding a way to like get in touch with that person that inspired me in the film industry. And then um, I ended up in uh, fashion that way. So if we kind of just stop fashion for a second and talk okay. about film. Are there any iconic moments in film that lives forever in your head? Uh, let's see. I mean, the film Atonement is incredible, but also Home Alone. Really? You know, um, I was blonde at one point in my life when I was young. And uh, in the Dominican Republic, I was probably one of the only blonde kids. And so everybody was like, oh, you're Macaulay Culkin. So if I ever meet Macaulay Culkin, I'm going to be like, you are the reason I'm here. <laughs> Was that a fashion moment or just like a popular culture moment? Pop culture moment. Okay, got I think it. that right. he, um, yeah, he awoke my interest in film. Okay. And then my dad taking me to see Jurassic Park and the fantasy that Steven Spielberg, Spielberg creates each time. And then, you know, Devil Wears Prada, obviously. Yeah. Um, just a few of the films that I love. I think about that oftentimes when I think about, I'm oftentimes fascinated by that moment that singes in your brain that you as a creative person or I'm sure there's some fashion designers here, fashion people here that you are always trying to recreate. For, for me, the, I'm, I'm from a different era, you know, so forgive me. That green dress in atonement has been okay. something that I've been trying to make every forever. single day. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's what, for me, it's, I mean, 
it's literally like Janet Jackson's Professor Principal yeah. video and Madonna kicking a pole in the borderline video. Something about that just clicked, it burned something in my head. Um, I think that the individuality, and feel free to laugh, yeah. but the Spice Girls yeah. created this need to like recreate you know, um, inclusivity in, in the way that everybody wanted to be like seen as. And so every time I would, hi, <laughs> every time I would see um, one of them do a different iteration of their personality, I became obsessed with like just sketching it and uh, accidentally created this um, self-teaching mechanism of learning how to like draw women through the Spice Girls. And by the time I was, I don't know, in high school, I was good at it. Who was your favorite Spice Girl? Ginger. Ginger. Really? Okay, now Posh. I like Posh, but Ginger had the spunkness to her that I liked. I think about um, a few minutes ago, but prior to us coming here, we talked. There was a conversation about mismatched socks and being yourself and uh, and being having a sense of individuality. That's always coupled with a bit of audacity. Where does audacity sit in your mind? I was, uh, I was with friends this weekend, and I have been cooking a lot lately. I don't know why, just like an urge. And my friend is like, oh, what's that recipe that you're doing for the pasta tonight? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I just like this you know, pesto, and I love the crunchiness of the garlic this way. And he's like, oh, you have like gay audacity. And I'm like, well, what? And he's like, yeah, you just like try things because you like something with this and this with that. And I think it's just like a need to like satisfy um, an attempt. Mm -hmm. I think that the, there is a saying, uh, uh, I forget what it is, but it's basically like, I'd rather know if I fail through knowing than not know that I tried, or whatever the expression is, but I've always been that way. So you took this drawings of women, that yeah. audacity of that. Gay audacity. Doodles. Yes. Gay audacity. <laughs> and then you decide, I'm going to take this gay audacity and start an architecture. Yes. And so how does that all fit in? Um, from the Dominican Republic, there was just honestly not a lot of, at that time, 2004, there wasn't a lot of like choices of careers, um, if I'm frank. But it's changed a lot more now, and it's a lot more diverse in careers uh, over there. But Architecture felt like the next best thing that I loved, and I gave it a shot, and I got into a good school. And then um, through the learning process, I discovered more about myself uh, as a creative person. Uh, never was it the goal for me to go from architecture to fashion. I just went there, I tried my best, I worked really hard, I, I, I did a good job. And then whenever I had the, the window to transition into something and it had um, a relatively low risk, uh, I, I tried. And uh, that was the, the moment that I found a connection to have someone introduce me to Oscar. The moment you met Oscar, were you nervous? Yeah, so South Bend, Indiana, uh, I went to school in Notre Dame, and when I graduated uh, from architecture there, the day after the graduation, I had to take four flights to get to Punta Cana, where he was spending a week, uh, and I got there with very little sleep, because at that time, there were very few direct flights from that town to Punta Cana. So I think four flights later, I arrived exhausted. And I think that that did me a favor because all of my nerves kind of like washed <laughs> off. So I show up and I must have looked really confident to him or something. Because I walk in and I'm just like literally on no sleep. I'm like, hey, and then he's like, here, let's have a seat. And I sit there and I have like all of my textbooks from architecture with doodles all over them, right? I assume he wants to see everything. But to my surprise, he sees one, opens it, and flips a page, sees the other, closes it. And then I go, I didn't get it. <laughs> he didn't like me. And then he stopped talking about my sketches and started talking about this girl, Laura. And in my mind, I'm like, why is he not looking at my sketches? Why? And why, who the hell is this Laura person? Like, I don't <laughs> care about Laura. I want to talk about you. And he's like determined to make me connect with Laura. And he wrote in the back of my airplane ticket, uh, and I have this framed, his phone number. 
and uh, he said, call my house this number tomorrow, and I'll get you the information for you to get in touch with Laura. And so he walked me back to where my father was in the living room, and my father and my father's friend, uh, Frank, uh, they were waiting like, like two dads waiting for the kid to come out of the, uh, the, the operation room. And they both looked at us like, okay, how was that? And then Oscar's like, uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna give him an internship. And I'm, that's when I hear it for the first time in front of my dad, who wanted me to like take over his like hardware store business in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> and my dad is like, oh, well, that didn't go as planned. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, I guess I gotta give it a shot. I, I have so many questions. Go. Okay. A, is it customary for Mrs. De Laurenta to interview interns? Uh, Mr. De Laurenta did not interview interns. Okay. And I don't know if he knew what he was going to meet me for. Okay, got it. Like, it wasn't like, oh, here, come meet an intern. It's like, hey, meet this boy who wants to be in fashion. And then my father was told, um, by the way, Oscar is uh, very blunt. No and if he doesn't think that this person is going to do something good for the company or for fashion, he's going to tell him. And my dad was like, good. <laughs> Getting that scared straight. Kind yeah. Of. And do you believe in true love? And what? Do you believe in true love? For sure. Do you believe that that Where's this going? <laughs> well, let's talk, let's talk in a bit. I, I'm, I'm not, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> do you, I think that's a fantastic day because you met two people that changed your life yeah, intrinsically. For sure. Law, you didn't meet Laura, but you heard the rumor of her, yeah. the ghost of her. The ghost. And then Mr. Renta at the same yeah. time. Yeah. No, so, that was probably one of the most important days of my life, if not the most important. Do you, do you and Laura fight a lot? All the time. How do you recover from fights? Uh, I think fights are a good way of expressing uh, what one needs in order to like, move into a next stage in your life. Um, and you compromise, just like in any relationship in life. You gotta listen to each other. And also, um, what's really important about my relationship with her, most of anything, is the trust. And I don't think that uh, it is common to meet someone uh, in your friend group, in your family even, that you just develop a very quick level of trust. When she and I met, it was wonderful to us to hear privately with the two of us, just the two of us, uh, harsh criticism about our work. And every single time we heard it with each other and we like built on this, uh, it would create more trust because we knew it came from a place of wanting to have the other person become better. And we became better. We kept improving with each other's help. And so we became inseparable. So fights, uh, to me, uh, the majority of time, come from a place of care. Laura and I always say to each other or to our close friends, if I'm not arguing with you about something that's going on in your life, it's because I don't care about it. So, I mean, let that sink in. Think about it. What's the last text she sent you? Um, I think you're fat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No joke. <laughs> <laughs> like scramble my brain, that's fine. Uh, so, when you take that combined energy and then you apply it to the world of Oscar, that is the mixture of, it's the cross street of history, legacy, and also the futurism. How do you blend those voices together? Uh, well, Laura and I didn't have the same um, point of view uh, when we got the creative director role as we do today. Yeah. When we got the job, we were Oscars like kids. And we were very much feeling like a father figure, even though he had passed away, had expectations of us, of what the first collection should be like without him. And that kind of pressure, subconsciously, like we didn't even speak about it, but we knew like, okay, we know he's not gonna like that, so we're gonna do that on the first show. And not that we didn't enjoy the first two years of our uh, collections there, but it, 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 it required time to uh, let us disarm our um, inhibitions and remember that at the end of the day, the people that we live with and go out with and have dinner with, uh, those are the people that we want to address. And if it's not true to our identity or to us, it will actually um, hinder the design. 
And I remember one collection, I think it was a collection that we did that was inspired by these uh, mosques. And uh, it was a very eclectic collection. It had a lot of different textures and walk -ups, walks of lives uh, blended in in a very cohesive way somehow. And it felt traveled, it felt uh, today, it felt uh, Laura and me. Um, and that took, that took two years, so it wasn't very much like, this is what we do from the beginning of Oscar's history to today's world. No, it, it required time because we are human, mm -hmm. you know, and we, we, we definitely needed time to like blend in um, Oscar's ideologies with ours. That's very, I, I do a lot of brand conversation and brand dissection and stuff like that. And I uh, personify a lot of brands a lot in my dialogue. And that's very, very true. It's not just about who is the Oscar person today. It's like, it's like who is she today underneath my skin, going out to dinner with me and engaging in my life. And then at the same time, but it's not exactly a literal interpretation. It's like a spirit of, you know, and I think that you've got, you, you two have done a fantastic job of like evolving. And I think it's been really good. Thank you. So when you think of the Monse girl and the Oscar girl, are they friends? You know what's funny is that um, we, they, are, they are actually the same woman. Uh, okay. A lot of our customers buy Monse for the day and Oscar, or excuse me, Monse for day and Oscar for evening. Oh. Um, so it, the duality exists mm -hmm. in women. You know, not, uh, I don't think any human being wants to look the same way uh, from day one till the day that they leave this earth. They go through fluctuations, and um, it's really fun to tap into one side of our brains for one brand and tap the other because, uh, like everybody, we sometimes get sick of our jobs. You know, we also want to like change it up and make it exciting, and we we get to we get to massage both sides of our brains this way and never get exhausted from one. When you think about the. If Monse was a fragrance, what would it be? Um, probably would it something. Smell like? Probably something masculine, if I'm honest, like uh, sexy, um, woody, uh -huh. something uh -huh. like that. I'm very interested in how to personify. Like you, when you create and you do the doodles, as you call it. I don't want to diminish it, but no, doodles. that's what I call it. Do you listen to music? Yes, a lot. What do you listen to? Um, let's see. Right now, I'm loving to hear the older albums of Kings of Leon. Um, I like a rock ballad of anyone's. Yeah. Like a snack, like a meatloaf. Yeah. Any oh. any kind of rock ballad to me oh. is um, is aligned with my brain somehow. I don't know why. You got to listen to some meatloaf share um, duets. Send it to me. I will. That's really really good. So we, let me ask you this: When does your imagination in terms of the surreal enter into your artwork? For example, do you ever dream and that, that kind of filters its way into your designs? Or you see a play or you see a movie, when does, the, when does it all kind of come together? To me, music uh, informs a lot of um, what I envision walking uh, with something that I create for that person. So if I hear a, a music or even like uh, a trailer of a movie or or a or a commercial uh, if it's got something that evokes like a thought of what the person is wearing in my head with that track then I make it and so we're sitting here talking about fashion is dead I oftentimes talk about rewriting luxury redefining luxury how does sustainability diverse uh, diversity and inclusion all the quote touch points that people can say to do lip service and stuff. Does that, I think it's a funny thing. Like, I don't think you sit there and think, okay, I'm a Dominican American designer and I'm gonna do this. And Laura doesn't say, I'm a female uh, AAIP run. No, you work and you do the best job at it. Yeah. I think it's yeah. part of our DNA, if I'm yeah. honest. Uh, Laura, uh, you know, she's from Seoul, Korea. Yeah. I'm Latino and European, yeah. uh, and we both have a very different perspectives, and the clash of the perspectives creates something uh, that in some part of the DNA of that garment probably connects with another person around the world, mm. because we are from other parts of the world besides America. Mm. Um, that's how I see it. 
and uh, sustainability, listen, it's hard, uh, it's improving. I think that fashion is definitely paying attention to it and now we are able to access mills that sell um, fabrics uh, that are more respectable to the environment and that didn't exist 10 years ago. So I think collectively it's moving along. If you take the future, kind of we have a crystal ball here, where do you kind of see you, Laura, Monse, the whole, the whole family? I think that that's, that question reminds me of when people ask me, oh, uh, you're starting your band, okay, what's your five-year plan? No, 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 no. It could be a next week <laughs> but plan. honestly, yeah. that's the same kind of answer I'm gonna yeah. give you. I don't know what's gonna happen yeah. in one year for either brand. It's, it's something that you need to sort of respect and let things uh, permeate into your brand, you know, change. If you just have a fucking, excuse me, <laughs> a goal from now till five years, uh, you're gonna be fighting against the grain right. a lot. Um, so I recommend that if you have a plan or you think you wanna achieve something, have 10 bullet points mm -hmm. and expect one of them to be accomplished. I love that. I think there's a lot of you know upcoming designers and artists in the room, and to hear that, to hear that, you know what? Hey, I started off in this place and I ended up here. I was open for this, open exactly. for life, Correct. open for relationships. Correct. That's people, great. you have to connect yeah. with the people around you. You yeah. know, I, I want. I had goals of of who I wanted to dress when I started in a fantasy and whatever. And um, I started to notice that I had other people that were trying to enter our ethos. And uh, I was like, but you're not, in my mind, I'm like, but you're not part of the plan, but okay, okay, so what do you, what do you? so I started to listen to the things and the people and the circumstances that were like coming to me organically. It wasn't anything I asked for, and like I said, I think that like one of the 10 things that I wanted to achieve is what stuck. And then the other nine were the things that came to me in a very organic, natural way. The people are around you that are excited to be with you uh, in work and life, um, pay attention. They want to be there. They want to be a part of your universe. Uh, and they will probably figure out ways to get your dreams come true more than the things that you want to get that you're not getting right now. So. There's a quote, if you want something bad enough, the whole world conspires to help you achieve it. You know, I really like that quote a little bit. It may not be what you Thank you. I think it's, yeah, it's, yeah, a, it's important yeah. to um, let the leash a little looser mm -hmm. yeah. to what the goal is. It will probably be a version of, your, of that goal. Not, I mean, I never thought I was going to be creative director. I was going to be really happy living a life in Chicago, being an architect. Yeah. And happy then, you're here. Or, what? We're happy you're here. <laughs> no, me too. But yeah. I'm just saying, I was like, okay, let's see where this goes. So we're rounding third a bit, and so I would have a few kind of rapid fire questions, and okay. if we have a few questions from the audience, we can kind of get there too, okay? Um, I'm gonna be extremely basic, favorite color? Color, uh, black and green. If there's any person you can dress living or dead, who would it be? Princess Diana. Oh, okay. Um, if there's any person who absolutely needs your help, you have to turn off the cameras for this. <laughs> who is it? Needs my help. I mean, <laughs> my best friend. I don't okay. know. <laughs> All right, go ahead. All right, all right. And uh, the last time you saw something truly beautiful. Um, Margot Robbie. <laughs> <laughs>